So a little bit about um, what I do now at Liberty IT. I um, work in the Emerging Business and Technology uh, Department and really that covers a, a wide selection of things, uh, IoT, uh, cloud, um, uh, big data security and um, uh, also very recently the, my own team which is a collaboration of hosting and developers so we're kind of living the DevOps dream and uh, set up a team and put some uh, hosting guys in with some developer guys and basically this is starting to see the results coming out of it. So uh, everyone probably has heard of Docker but it's kind of um, it's not the easiest thing maybe to explain. Uh, it's an open source engine and that's the important part. It's not the containers or the images, it's actually the engine that the, allows you to create and run the containers. Um, and these are lightweight, portable and self-sufficient. Um, and the application runs inside the container. So it's like Schrodinger's cat, if you think about it in reverse. The application goes inside the container and it's not aware of where it's running. And this is to solve the problem really. Uh, you've got all types of servers, all types of different languages and frameworks, uh, different types of application versions. And trying to maintain all those is impossible. Um, so that's why Docker came about. So if I was doing this presentation probably last year, um, this uh, is where we'd be talking about. We're talking about portability and we still will be, but um, and lots of shipping references. Um, I, I don't know many actual, um, these were the, this was the slide pack. Um, not many international shipping moguls are uh, around. So, um, but the, the principle of this is really to say that uh, there was a problem like this in the real world uh, for uh, transporting goods and they came out with the intermodal, intermodal shipping container uh, whereby that you could pack all different types of goods, different shapes and sizes inside a single container and then because you knew the dimensions and size of that container you can build your infrastructure around it uh, and it doesn't matter where, uh, where you are, you don't have to unpack stuff. So because we're not all um, shipping moguls, uh, I decided that I had to do a presentation before to explain what a container was. And I came up with uh, a different type of container, uh, which I'm more used to. Uh, so these are takeaway containers. Um, and this is really at a high, very high level because we all got so focused on portability. Uh, which is the number one feature, but these guys are extremely cheap and they're extremely lightweight. And uh, it was that part I think that we'd lost uh, focus on. So to bring it back into, and I could also bring it with me, um, the idea is that the lollipop inside is the um, application and with inside the container you can put in anything that the application needs and effectively build it out. It also meant then that I was able to take these containers and there's a nice MacBook there. The container will run on the MacBook as it, but it will also run on the PC. So I could demonstrate very quickly the idea and the concept that the application's contained in here and everything that it needs uh, it to, to run uh, is also within inside the container. Um, so that was, that was one uh, thing that we did just to try and emphasize this lightweight. So, um, uh, what do I actually mean by lightweight? Uh, is that compared to VMs, I think we had this conversation outside, is that a container is like a VM. It, it is, but it's not. Um, the, the real key difference is that a virtual machine needs uh, the entire operating system and um, uh, inside it to be able to uh, uh, to be able to run, uh, a, whereas with the uh, with a container, all you have to do is supply the kernel inside it. 
So it's significantly uh, light, lighter in terms of uh, server density. So you can get more containers on the same infrastructure, giving greater cost savings. So again, it's a, Google, it's, it's a better way to explain uh, the cost savings. Uh, that these are very, very cheap uh, and they're disposable. Another benefit here as well, because uh, the way it's done now, uh, you can share binaries. So uh, containers of the same application can actually share binaries, uh, bringing down that server density even further. Now, these are Linux containers. Uh, so typically Docker has been uh, Linux focused. That's changing uh, as of uh, Last year, uh, Windows 2016, it's starting to support uh, Windows containers as well. But by and large, at the, the focus has been to the date on uh, Linux containers. Um, and when you think about this, what does that mean? Uh, actually, when you have to restart a, a virtual machine, you have to wait for that operating system to boot up. That could take a couple of minutes. Uh, so we've moved from uh, manual uh, processes into continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, and we're trying to spin these applications up as quickly as possible and min minimise downtime. So you don't have to wait for the operating system to spring back in life. Effectively, a container will run like a service does on a uh, uh, on an operating system. So. The, uh, the, instead of being minutes, it will be seconds. So there's a big benefit. Uh, also, these slides are from uh, Docker below, and I've added some comments to them. Uh, so look, part of what we do here, er, er, what we do at Liberty, is look at how um, these tools are being used so then we can um, bring them into our business. Uh, so we knew that people liked it for development. It's very easy to spin up Docker on a uh, on, on a laptop and be able to develop on it. Uh, but it's very interesting. On the uh, the right hand side of the this is the fifty eight percent now running applications in production. Docker has matured in the last year or two, and there's now enough confidence around it that you can actually have your applications stood up running in a production environment it's no it came out of the uh, it's it's a nice cool thing to is that this is actually usable uh, in, by businesses the so confidence is increased and people are actually planning their devops around it as a result so uh, if you think about pipelines and how you want to uh, do deployment um, Docker sort of simplifies this. Uh, the octopus, which you'll see several times, is referring to Docker Compose. Um, so we're moving to microservices, and because we move to microservices, actually deployment uh, it gets more difficult, or uh, I suppose it's the organization of that. There's more moving parts. Um, so Compose tackles that problem. It lets you define uh, multiple containers uh, and be able to, 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 to spin those up. Uh, and it's all about this cadence, that Docker is actually increasing the, um, the, your rate of uh, your ability to uh, release software at uh, a higher rate. Uh, now, but there, there's other spins on this. There's a company called Riot Games. Uh, and what they did is they created uh, a problem for themselves. They open sourced all their development work to their community and got uh, their users to contribute back the code. Uh, they set up a pipeline and uh, uh, this was great because they didn't have to do it and they had they just concentrated on having the pipeline and providing that. Uh, but what they found is because they, they did that, uh, then all the, the community was actually coming up with great interesting ways to do but they couldn't keep up because every time that they had to 
uh, a person came up with a new idea, they picked their technology that they want to put into the uh, build pi pipeline. And the guys at Rag Games had to change their build infrastructure. Um, so they're using Jenkins in their build machines. So what they actually decided to do was, well, why not have that on Docker and then let the community uh, provide the Docker file to spin up the environment to actually build the code. So you can completely, um, you, you can look at it just as a straightforward uh, use in a pipeline or you can actually use Docker itself in the pipeline as a tool to uh, define how that's going to be built. And then transforming monolith to microservices. It's brand new code, T today we, we write in microservices, but uh, traditionally we've used monoliths. Um, and, but I, I'm talking about the large application that gets willed into life and uh, uh, hopefully just stays there and you shut it down as one go. Uh, they, they're massive applications and we've actually seen this already in, in Liberty where um, very large applications uh, being able to be run on, um, on a MacBook. Uh, and the reason why this is done is and most organizations are like this, as you move applications into uh, production or even pre-production environments, those environments get more and more locked down. So what this guy did was he took uh, an application that he wasn't actually allowed to touch in a, a non-production environment and be able to spin it up on his MacBook. And that allowed him to refactor it and play about with it without the danger of breaking anyone else. Uh, so that was his goal, but actually what he found as well was that um, he's splitting up into microservices, uh, but he also found as well that uh, as developers traditionally came onto that team, it would take uh, an awful lot of um, time to get used to how you develop that code. Your machine would have to be set up a certain way. You'd have to go through a lot of uh, documentation and what to do to get your environment your development environment set up. But what Docker did for them was that actually, now that's all in Docker, a new developer can come into, onto the team. They can get any sort of hardware. Docker's installed onto it and they're, they're starting from scratch, or they're starting with an actual working um, environment. So it simplifies that, that environment. So yes, about moving to microservices. Uh, these are just some of the little um, components of Docker that you probably see. There's an awful lot of uh, nautical uh, terms. So we've got Docker machine. Uh, that's sort of disappearing now. So anywhere that Docker can't the Docker engine can't natively run, uh, you can use Docker machine um, and uh, it, it will then run in that environment. I'm thinking there specifically if you have a Windows 7 64-bit, you'd need to have Docker machine run on it. Docker registry is, um, is a repository where Docker images can be stored. Uh, and then we have a Docker file, Docker compose.yaml. Uh, those two files in there are two of the common files that we use. And Docker compose and Docker swarm, and I'll go into these. Uh, so anyone who hasn't used Docker, you start with a Docker file. Well, you start with installing Docker on your machine. Uh, it's a text file called Docker file, and uh, the first part of it is always uh, from. So this is sort of the kernel or the base image that you want to start from. Um, so your Docker Hub has a list of all these base images that you can pull down from. Um, now, when you're checking, check that they're official because it is an open community, and there could be malicious stuff in there or uh, well, uh, so you pull your image, your base image down, and then you start to add your code on top of it. So this one's Ubuntu, and then we're doing an app get, and then we're copying our source code into it, and we're exposing port 8080, uh, and we're also saying that it's going to run the bash command at the end of it. So that was our, what our Docker file did, and then we have this Docker build command that we can run, which takes that text file and takes your source code 
and anything else that needs and then that builds the image. So that's the idea of parceling up everything you need ready for that self at contained container. And then that image, the next thing that you want to do with this is the ship part. So we, do, we tag the image, we do a Docker login and we do a Docker push and that pushes it up to the Docker hub or you can have a, a Docker uh, registry as well in there. So you can have a local version of that which is just somewhere that you want to push to as part of your pipeline. So that's the ship part. And then finally, and this would happen, this could happen on the same machine or it could happen on a, a, a different machine for deployment. Then you just have to uh, do a Docker run command, uh, give it the, uh, the name of the image that you've created that's stored on your repository and the link to the repository. Uh, by default, it will always go to Docker Hub uh, and that will start your application. So that's, that's how it simplifies deployment of a single file. So then Docker Compose is where we're taking, right, we can build one image, which is great, but we're dealing in a world of complicated uh, structures. Uh, so if we have lots of these, then it starts getting back to this problem. We have to do lots of Docker runs and we have to link them all together. So Docker Compose lets us spin up multiple containers and I can run all these containers with one command on, the, uh, on this system. And they're all linked together. So Docker as well controls networks. So you can create a, a bridge network and compose if I'm running on the one machine. And this is how it looks. The, the Docker compose YAML file basically calls out services. Um, so in this case, there's a, there's a web service and in here there's a build dot, which is similar to my run command. So it knows to go off to look for the Docker file. Um, command spelled wrong, but uh, you can put your commands in here, ports, volumes, and links in there, and basically supply parameters. Uh, so that when I do my Docker compose up command, it will create that service. Now over here, there's a Redis uh, container, or Redis service listed as well. Uh, now that the difference with this one is I haven't specified a build command. Uh, so what that will do is it will just go off to Docker Hub and pull down a, a, a image. So you can mix between pulling images from a registry and pulling images and building them uh, as well. So we went from a single container to multiple containers. Uh, and then finally Docker Swarm, which is taking this and uh, moving it across where we have different distributed infrastructure. But we still want the convenience of being able to log in at one single point. So Docker Swarm has this discovery phase. So these are all Docker engines here, three Docker engines, and actually the Swarm Manager will also be a Docker engine. And this will be part of the demo. Um, the user logs in through the, uh, the command line uh, and sets up, first of all, sets up the, um, the, the discovery phase and connects the Swarm Manager to the Docker engines. Uh, the next thing that we can do is it has the capability of scheduling. By scheduling, what I'm talking about here, by default, it's spread. So as you add on containers, it will spread them across uh, the engines. Now you could do different patterns. You can do bin pack, um, you can do random, uh, but effectively spread is the default one to start building out those containers. As well as this, you've also got, so those containers as well have high availability. If one of those engines was to go down, and I'll demo this, those containers will move on to the remaining infrastructure, which is brilliant for microservices. Uh, you can as well for the Swarm Manager set up high availability in a similar way. Um, so if the Swarm Manager, this one here is the leader, but if that leader was to go down, one of the other two Swarm Managers would uh, take over. And again, we have networks, but unlike the network 
uh, on a single machine, which was a bridge network. We're now talking about an overlay network. So Swarm uses this overlay network. Um, and we have the idea of plugins too. Uh, those plugins could be if you want to use a different type of network or if you um, want to uh, uh, mount to a, a volume or something that is persistent because we're now across different p bits of infrastructure there. So I'm going to demo this and hopefully it's going to work. And I'm going to do it on, everyone else has talked about these things and I'm going to try and run with one. Um, okay. I'm just SSHing into um, this is a this is a Docker Pi on the bottom uh, with a cluster hat and three uh, Pi zeros on it. Now the only purpose of this is to of the red the red car there is the cluster hat. Um, what it's allowing me to do is um, uh, remove a lot of the network and the Ethernet cables. It's using a USB OTG to network the little Pi zeros on the top. They're four pound ago, so they're very cheap, but they're all uh, Pi's. So what's happening here is it's just starting up. It's turning on the, the little lights. I think they're already on, but uh, it, it powers on the uh, zeros. And I'm not actually typing, uh, it's scripted to, uh, to make sure that I don't do typos. So uh, the first thing we'll do is I'm going to do a visualizer which will actually show what's happening on the, within the swarm. Um, and this is actually running as a Docker container. So I'm doing a Docker run here. This isn't going to be included in the swarm. Uh, and actually this is Docker with inside Docker, which is a very bad thing, but uh, for the purposes of this demo, it will be fine. And I can see there that I have my container up and running. So this is, this is how you create a swarm. Um, so you can't spoil the surprise of it. Um, Nothing actually there at the moment. Um, uh, so you basically initiate, initiate the swarm on the uh, controller, which is the, the bottom Raspberry Pi. Uh, so it's put that now as the manager and we've seen on the visualizer. We've now got one, we've got our Later. So uh, just SH, it, once you do that, it actually returns back the command to run on the other um, Raspberry Pis. And basically in turn, you'll see them spin up. So we've now... Uh, So we've now got a, uh, we've now got all our infrastructure working in a swarm. So we've got the controller on one side, and then Pi, uh, Pi one of the Pi zeros is P one, and I want P two, and I want P three. Um, and so the controller and the P one are names, and then the roles are manager and worker underneath. So what can we do with a swarm? Um, so that was the discovery phase that I had in my slides. We can create a network. Uh, this is a list of the standard networks are there. Uh, you'll notice in here there's drivers and the drivers are type bridge and overlay are the two that we're interested in. Bridge, as I said, was for Docker uh, Compose on a single piece of infrastructure. Uh, 
but to create a new network for Swarm, we want overlay. And so Docker network create driver overlay, and I'll give it a name, my network. I'll just check that that is created. And we now have a new overlay network. There's nothing in it yet. We have to add a service to that network. Um, so the uh, the key parts here are the uh, Docker service create uh, replicas two, and I've given it a constraint where the node has to be a worker. Uh, I've told it which network, so I've said my network, which was the network I created a minute ago. Um, I've picked a image name that's saved up there. It's just a Alpine uh, scratch image. And I've given it a command in here. So these are now, well, these are now our containers that are actually running. Our application is running on Pi 1 and Pi 3, um, which is great. So the microservices, you think about these are, these are two instances of a microservice. So we're talking about being able to scale here. Uh, and we can actually specify that at runtime. Um, but we can go back. That's just giving me a, an information the same as the graphics. What I'm going to do here is do a scale of my services up to three. And we've now got three containers. Um, so if you think about having to deploy an application, it's not normally as simple as that uh, with infrastructure. I know these are Raspberry Pis, but this would translate to um, any servers, provided that you have the Docker engine pre-installed. Now, the final part of my test is what would happen if I pulled the plug on one of these Raspberry Pis. And I'll take the power off. So if we move to microservices, the one thing that you have to be worried about microservices, so that Raspberry Pi is now shut down, the microservice is dead, uh, and I didn't do anything. Docker was able to uh, spin that uh, container with that application running back up on one of the remaining parts of the infrastructure. So I think that's a key factor if we move to microservices because it's a distributed uh, application. Uh, we need to be able to have this power of being able to have the robustness. And that's, that's it, really, for Docker. Yes, so they, uh, by putting the, these into swarm mode, the, um, the leader that's on the controller is is basically keeping a check on it on the rest of the infrastructure. So that's why there's a slight delay. So uh, you can change the time period, uh, but the leader uh, is basically checking back in, or sorry, the manager, which is in leader mode, is checking back in to see the health of the infrastructure. So it sees that uh, one of the uh, swarm workers has went down, and it will basically then try and uh, fix that and spread that uh, container with the application over here. Now these are actually, by default it's load balanced, but it's load balanced at layer four. Uh, so you would still have to put in a HTTP load balancer if you wanted to expose this um, as a proper load balanced uh, web application. So you could use something like Nginx in there. Um, uh, but that you would have this robustness, really, that uh, you can have all your processing done on uh, on a swarm and let it take care of it. Sorry. Um, so, the, the by creating that network, 
it actually so Swarm does all the networking in the background. Uh, but if you've seen in the containers, when we declared some of the containers, you can expose. So you can say, I'm exposing port uh, 8080, uh, and then be able to go into that network or go into that container. Uh, but by default, all containers within the same network can't talk to each other. So if the Nginx would still be inside the same network, then you don't have to, you don't have to do that, and it can dynamically scale as well.